Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back to our uh, session part two of our Jehovah Witness series with Mike Winger. Uh, it's our Contending for the Faith, uh, what is it, conference. That really isn't kind of a conference. It's more like a webinar because of the coronavirus. So uh, if you haven't uh, watched the first part, go back and watch that. We, we're just methodically working through what a Jehovah Witness uh, believes, what the church teaches. And so you're joining us for our second part of that, and we're just going to continue along. And this is Mike Winger, if you don't know him, and everyone should know him by now, and everyone should love him by now. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk. Uh, we talked a little bit about salvation, and let's talk now about God. Like, they have, they have an interesting, because, like, we believe God a certain way, and so do they. So what is their belief in, in God? Mm. Now, I, I just want to make clear that people know, uh, so people know there's a difference between sort of like in-house debates and discussions amongst Christians, like about uh, the gifts of the spirit, um, you know, questions about all kinds of issues, uh, baptism and things like that. But but this is not an in-house discussion. When we talk about the very nature of who God is, and if, 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 if you're substantially different than scripture, it in no way is a Christian thing at all. And so the view of God on Jehovah's Witnesses is very different, and it has to do mostly with the doctrine of the Trinity. They definitely reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, oddly enough, if you know theology well, you'll see that what they actually reject is, is called modalism. What they usually do is they, they argue that what we believe is something called modalism, that the Father became the Son who then became the Spirit, which is not a Trinity, right? That's just him like changing clothes, so to speak. Um, and then they argue against that view. Um, so it's very confusing when you're, when you're talking with them about it. But they believe that Jesus, he's not God in the flesh. No, no, he's a created being. He's Michael the Archangel. They believe the Holy Spirit is not personal, is 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 actually an active force and has no personality, um, w would therefore have no will or intentions or desires or things like that because it's just like God's like energy or something like that. Okay. So they say the Trinity is pagan and we can support it in the Old Testament thoroughly people don't even realize how strong the old testament teaches uh, and supports at least the doctrine of the trinity and we can teach it in the new testament very 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 thoroughly which is why they have their own translation of the bible called the new world translation where they systematically alter texts that teach the trinity so it won't give us the deity of jesus in particular or the personhood of the holy spirit so this is this is this is where they deny it, fundamental christian truth this is why they have to say that christians since the second century a.d have been totally off the rails, uh, you know, part of the kingdom of Satan, all Christians from that time, because we have this doctrine called the Trinity. So they have to change the Bible. They have to deny church history. Well, John 5, 23 says this. It's, it's Jesus himself speaking. He says that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. And whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Now, I honor the father as God. I should honor the son the same way. And those are from Jesus's own words. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty serious divergence from biblical teaching here. You did a study on the Trinity. It was really good. So if somebody really wants to know more about it, like that's what I love about when you teach, like you're just very methodical about this verse, this, this goes with it. it it's really good. So if you're confused about that, then. Um, yeah. And can I say for that teaching, it's, it's, it's um, are we right about the Trinity? I think is the name of the teaching. But the idea I did there is I took objections to the Trinity and I put a bunch of them up at the front of the study and asked a bunch of challenging, hard questions. Then I did an explanation of the Trinity and then I answered all the objections systematically. And so that was meant to bring people from a place of confusion to a place of clarity on the topic. Okay. Um, lots of questions coming through about um, how do I share Jesus with my Jehovah Witness um, neighbors friends, things like that. So we're going to get to that. But what I want to do is I, I want to make that towards the end, because if we get through the, the main, what they believe first, then I think we can go into, into, into all that. Yeah, some um, tactics, yeah. They spend a lot of time, you know, of course, the word Jehovah, Jehovah witness, mm -hmm. Jehovah, what explain that portion of it. Yeah, so the name Jehovah is very, very significant for the group Jehovah's Witnesses, not just because it's in the name of the group, but because they think that it's God's proper name and it's properly pronounced Jehovah and God ultimately will not respect you or respond to you if you don't call him by his name. And that is their, that is their doctrine on this. Um, so well, let me give you a couple of verses they use to support this. And here's how they'll, if they hit you at your door, they'll say, hey, 
Are you using God's name? Well, Acts 4.12, it says there's salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so they imply like, if you don't use his name, you're not going to be saved. But if you just read the whole entry, Acts 4 verses 10 through 12, the very verse that they use is actually about Jesus, not the name Jehovah. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Acts 4.12 is about Jesus. He's the name you've got to call on. And I don't think God cares about pronunciation. Jesus, Iesu in the, in the Greek, um, Jesus in, in Spanish or Yeshua in Hebrew. God doesn't care. It's about who he is that, and that you're calling on him. Another verse they use for this is Romans 10, 13, where it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. So this is, um, this is actually quoting the Old Testament. It's quoting Joel 2, 32, which is about Yahweh or, or Jehovah. But if you look at it in context, it talks about Jesus, Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So this is, again, this is about Jesus. These are actually their proof texts. So the, the very texts that they're quoting often prove them wrong. And this is actually really the case for cults in general. They usually quote verses that prove them wrong if you just look at them in context. If you don't know what else to do, just slow down, look at the verses before and after, and you'll usually see right through it. Now, ironically, the, the phrase Jehovah is probably the wrong pronunciation of God's name in the Bible. Uh, we, we see it capital L-O-R-D in our Old Testament. When we see Jehovah, it comes up many, many times, thousands of times in the Old Testament. Well, it was like, we don't know how it's translated for sure, but it was likely translated Yahweh. That's like the, the scholarly majority says it was translated Yahweh or it's pronounced Yahweh. Um, but it definitely wasn't Jehovah. It might've been Yehovah, but it wasn't Jehovah because there's no J in Hebrew. There's just no J sound in the language at all. But Russell didn't know this. Those guys didn't know this because they don't know the languages like they're pretending they do sometimes. So ironically, what the Jehovah's Witnesses have been taught to do is focus on a wrong pronunciation of Jehovah instead of on the true identity of Jehovah. They want you to say, you have to pronounce and say his name right while yet denying who he is. And the, thereby like the whole idea just backfires in a terrible spiritual disaster. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the 144,000. <laughs> uh, Cause right. they really like somewhere along the line, I'm not certain how they got this all wrong. Cause it's like the Bible is very clear in revelation who the 144,000 are. Mm -hmm. So how do they get away with, with thinking what they think? Yeah, so they take a, a puzzling passage in, in Revelation that talks about 144,000. Um, and, you know, they say this is the anointed class. They're the only ones who take communion. When they pass communion around, they're the only ones who actually partake. It's a special group who's going to reign in heaven in spiritual bodies. They won't get a physical resurrection. They'll just reign in heaven in spiritual bodies, according to them. The rest of mankind will be annihilated or, or, or other JWs who are not part of the 144,000. They'll live on paradise earth in uh, remade bodies. But the passage they quote is Revelation 7, verses 4 through 8, which is not talking about anything like that. It's talking about the end times. That's true. And it says that there are 144,000 people sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then it names the tribes, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Nephtali. You know, it goes through all the tribes. Well, in, the, in another parallel passage in Revelation 14, verses 3 through 4, it shows more about these 144,000. It says that, um, let's see, no one could learn the song except 144,000. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These, so there, we know three things about these 144,000 based on Revelation. One, they are Jewish, 12,000 from each tribe. Two, they are males. Three, they are virgins. They haven't fornicated and they also have not gotten married. So they haven't done either of those things. Those are the three things we know. But the Jehovah's Witnesses, they take the, the 144,000 number and they say, that's literal. There's literally 144,000, but they're not Jews. They're not from the tribes. They're not male and they're not virgins. This is, this is like exactly how you see that someone's making up new theology, right? They just take a verse and rip it out of context. 
if Revelation's literal here, which I tend to think it is, is talking about actual Jews, basically a revival amongst Israel in the end times, and I'm looking forward to that. If it's symbolic, well, then the whole 144,000 teaching just goes out the window in the, you know, altogether. Um, no serious person who studies Revelation thinks that the Jehovah's Witness interpretation has even a chance of being right. Now go back to that. So th they say that there's, so like, I'm a Jehovah Witness and I'm going door to door and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Are, but there's way more than 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses on this earth. You said there's 8 million, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. oh, well, yeah, what's, what's the deal with that? What's like, the deal I, with that? So um, this is where I think the teaching evolved. I think initially it was a small group. So he thought 144,000, are you going to get in? But once they grew beyond that, they had to have something to explain all the people that wouldn't fit that number. So now they have two groups of Jehovah's Witnesses, this sort of super, super godly 144,000 people, and then there's everybody else. And they have two different destinations. When these people die and, you know, in the future, they're going to be up in heaven, actually, with God. And then the rest of these people will be on earth, at the new earth. Now, Revelation talks about how there's going to be no difference, right? Heaven comes to earth, the new Jerusalem comes down, God is with us on earth. So, so these these two separate things don't make sense biblically, but that's the teaching they have. Um, you talk about, because they, you know, they go to door to door. Of course, we know that. What, why is, what's their reasoning behind that? Like it has to have something to do with this whole workspace. Yes. So part of the reason it, for the Jehovah's, let's just take like the motivations are different. For the individual witness, the one who's going around, it's different than the motivation for the organization. For the individual witness, their motivation is, um, for, uh, for salvation, uh, because they have to do this to maintain membership and to be considered an, quote, an active publisher. That's like a category you want to make sure you're in. And so they, they have to do this. This is, they have to report their hours every week and that sort of thing. It's, there's a lot of pressure there and they want to, they want to go to heaven. Um, oddly enough, they, they, I don't know if you've noticed this. Okay. I've no, I've seen it so many times that I, it's more than a trend is that they walk so slow. <laughs> and I thought when I've gone witnessing even door to door and I walk so fast from house to house because I've only got so much time. Right. And I want to get as many of these tracks out and share with people. They walk so slow. Well, when I actually interviewed former Jehovah's Witnesses, they told me that this is not only a fact, it's a joke amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. And they call it the pioneer plod because they people going door to door are pioneers. They call them and they call it the pioneer plod because they trying they're trying to wait out their hour. They don't have to hit a certain number of doors. They have to be out there for a certain amount of time. So it's, it's a works thing. Uh, now for the organization, it's all about growth. Because as they go door to door, they're handing out magazines. They're giving out magazines. They're publishing, publishing. That started from Russell, right? And this is how they promote the group. And to them, it's also the organization. It's also like a point of proof. They think that they're the only group of people who were doing the work that Jesus told us to do when he says, like, go into all the world. And they say, we're the only ones publishing door to door. But this isn't even true. There's, there's, there's churches that go door to door. There's um, around the world. Here's a quick statistic for you. In 2004, Jehovah's Witnesses baptized 200,000 people, which is quite a few, right? But they have a really low retention rate. People don't tend to stay for very long. Um, but the, just the Baptists, just one, one denominational group within Christianity, they baptized 600,000 people and planted 21,000 new churches. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are told that one way they know that the Watchtower is the true church of God is that they're, they're the only ones really publishing God's word to people but this is just not true. They're just isolated. So they don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. Right. At any rate, it's not even evangelism because what they're publishing is not the gospel. So it, it's, if anything, all these door to door trips are not a good work. They're a bad work. Yeah, exactly. It's very deceptive. Um, okay. Let's talk about um, you interviewed and it was a really good interview with the, the couple that they were Jehovah witnesses and mm -hmm honestly, the, the church keeps them so busy that they don't even have time to think. So talk about like a day in the, a week in the life of a Jehovah Witness. Yeah. So they talked about when they had were, were more earlier converts, when they had just sort of first gotten involved in the group. And I asked them what their re regular week was like. And they said, well, on Monday, they walked through the week. They said on Monday, we'd spend about two hours preparing for Tuesday where we would have Bible study time, which is really studying Watchtower material, not the Bible, right? They quote the Bible out of context, but they don't study it. So Monday, two hour prep. Tuesday, they would have about two hours of study time doing their meeting, a gathering. On, on Wednesday, they would have another two hours of preparation time. On Thursday, another two hour meeting. 
this is to do another Bible study going through Watchtower literature. Remember, there's just mountains of literature they have to go through. On Saturday, they would do at least one hour of witnessing and then sometimes other laborers. Maybe they would go and they would work on the, on the building, on the local building, because a lot of them are artisans uh, and, and uh, workmen with their hands. Then on Sunday, they have their regular church services, their gathering. So six days a week, you've got stuff that's, that fits right into the free time you had when you got off work that day, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're very busy. Now, this has two results, if you think about it. One, it creates social isolation. You become a Jehovah's Witness. Let's say you're a new convert even. You, just, you don't have time for anybody else in your life, right? It's all just going to be Jehovah's Witnesses. So you get social, socially isolated, and, you're, and this is going to make it harder for you to think clearly about issues or to leave the group. And two, you have no time to really study the Bible on your own, to go and research anything, to go and find out the problems that there, there might be, because all your time is spent getting indoctrinated into Watchtower literature and then doing tasks for the Watchtower. Oh, Mike, that's so scary. It really, it really is. Um, which is why you talk about how we need to be the most compassionate people to them. Like a lot of people are just like, you're, get out of my yard, you know, you're a crazy person. But really, when you understand all the things that they have to do in their mindset, you almost have to feel really sad for them. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I've seen comments like on my YouTube videos where they're like, well, I just say this to Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> and they, and they're like thinking of ways to mock or ridicule them. And I'm like, that's so ungodly. It's so unchristian. I think we have to be careful. I, th I think a great analogy is to treat Jehovah's Witnesses like, like a contagious victims, right? They've, they've, they've contracted something that's hurting them. They're also contagious. So you have to be careful that you don't contract it as well. So you prepare yourself, you glove up or whatever, and you go and you try to assist them without getting it yourself. And that's, that's my goal as I witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I want to seek to help them out of the deceit without getting myself deceived at the same time. Jesus's attitude though, I mean, the people are crucifying him. His attitude is father, forgive them. Right. You know, he says, turn the other cheek. He has such an attitude of compassion and love. Christianity is by nature invitational. God made one of his most successful apostles out of a murderer, Saul. And, and so the church had a hard time with this, right? When Saul first got saved, they were like, we don't know. We're not so sure that he's really genuine or not. And that's understandable. But, but God is wanting to do a supernatural work where he takes these people, brings them to the true light of the gospel, restores and renews their lives, and we can be the ones inviting them into that and, and definitely not the ones uh, who want to mock and ridicule and name call and add more burdens onto the burdens they're already experiencing. Perfect. You, you have a verse in there too. Um, yeah. Um, this is a great verse for witnessing uh, just to remind ourselves of our attitude. Um, it says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge, a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And this is, this is, it sets the tone for us, gentleness, respect, willing to, so we engage in disagreement, but we do it with a certain attitude. We, we engage to say, Hey, you're wrong, but it's only because we want to get you right with God. It's a battle, not against you. It's a battle for you. And that's uh, that's our, our attitude. Perfect. Um, if you were a Jehovah Witness and you, you know, your whole world is basically your friends, the people, the church body. So like you said, it's very uh, inward, you know, it's just that this specific group. But what happens if you, let's say you've got a, someone here listening today and they're like, I need to leave the church. But if I leave the church, then, then my entire all the people that I know, like my, my whole base is gone too. So, mm. so, so talk, talk to that. What happens if a person leaves and what, if they're like, I'm going to really go and follow Jesus, the biblical Jesus now, it really is. It's a, it's a tough decision. Yeah. I mean, it would be, we can understand it as in to be tough because you're leaving a social circle, but it's, it's more than that. And Jehovah's Witnesses, they're, what they're taught makes it a lot more than that. So what I, what I want to do is first share with you this. Um, <clears throat> according to like jwfacts.com, which I find to be a very useful resource for researching these things, over 1% of Jehovah's Witnesses are shunned every year. Shunned, I use that word shunned. Let, let's talk about what it means to shun or to disfellowship because disfellowshipping isn't just a spiritual, like you're not part of our congregation. It's a lot more than that. 
it's not like biblical excommunication or, or disfellowshipping. It's, it goes way beyond that. So here's some quotes from the Watchtower so you can see it in their own words. Um, the first one's Watchtower 1963, July 15th, 15th, page 444. The wrongdoer has to realize that his status is completely changed, that his faithful Christian relatives thoroughly disapprove of his wicked course and show this disapproval by limiting contacts to only those which are unavoidable. Imagine if your children did this to you. Imagine if your parents did this to you, your wife or your husband did this to you. This is what they teach you to do. Um, in Kingdom Ministry, August 2002, page three, they wrote this. What about speaking with a disfellowship person? Like this is like even a question they have to ask. Are you allowed to talk to them? Well, it says, while the Bible does not cover every possible situation, 2 John 10 helps us get Jehovah's view of the matter. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, neither receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him. Now, just so you know, uh, in 2 John verse 10, what this is actually talking about here is um, mi about missionaries who are bringing false gospels. Don't be a host to them where you take them into your home and they stay with you for like a week when you feed them and you help them on their mission. It's not talking about just talking to people. At any rate, they go on and say, commenting on this, the Watchtower of September 15th, 1981, page 25 says, a simple hello to someone can be the first step that develops into a conversation and maybe even a friendship. These are obviously dangerous things. Would we want to take that first step with a disfellowship person? After hearing a talk at a circuit assembly, a brother and his fleshly sister realized that they needed to make adjustments in the way they treated their mother who lived elsewhere and who had been disfellowshipped for six years. Immediately after the assembly, the man called his mother and after assuring her of their love, he explained that they could no longer talk to her unless they were important family matters requiring contact. <sighs> this is, this is, I, there's more. I, I, I got to read these quotes to you because it, it puts it in their own words. Uh, Watchtower 1970, June 1st, page 351 and 352 says this. Yet there might be some absolutely necessary family members of matters requiring communication, such as legalities over a will or property, but the disfellowship relative should be made to appreciate that his status has changed, that he is no longer welcome in the home, nor is he a preferred companion. I mean, what are you telling, like, say, a wife to treat to do to her husband? When, make sure he knows he's not your preferred companion. Like, that's destructive to marriages. That's not biblical. In Watchtower 1952, they wrote, <clears throat> if the children are of age, then there can be a departing and breaking of family ties in a physical way because the spiritual ties have already snapped. So if your kids are, like, over 18, you could just cut them off entirely. Now, what does Scripture say? It does talk about a, a, a separation in the church, right? But it doesn't at all relate this to a family shunning or anything like that. In fact, it says, hey, wives, 1 Corinthians 7, if you're married to an unbelieving husband, make it work. Be a great wife. Honor God. First Peter talks about it too. Honor God. You're, you should be a better wife, husband, father, son, daughter. You should be better because you're a Christian, not worse. And if they're unbelievers, it doesn't change that obligation. So you can find on the internet all kinds of stories from Jehovah's Witnesses, former JWs, talking about how they were shunned, about how when people see them, they will cross the street just to avoid them so they can just, because they can't even say hello. They'll talk about stories about how within a week, um, the, the local leaders of their congregation went and just ripped on them to all their friends and family. They called everybody to make sure that they knew, don't talk to them anymore. Now, here's a question. Why on earth are they doing this? And some think it's because they're just so mad at the people they're shunning. And I have a different theory. My theory is this. Once Jehovah's Witnesses start thinking outside the box, they quickly become, you know, deconversion experiences and they leave the group and they often become Christians, true Christians. Well, that's contagious. And so to protect the people that are still in the bubble, they quickly cut off entirely those who are not. It's to keep it from, uh, keep what they discovered from getting to these people who they still have control of. Okay. Oh man. All crazy right. Stuff. It's crazy stuff. Uh, where we have our Bible study, they always said, well, they used to have a, a whole section of our Jehovah witnesses that would come. They would sit right out front. It would always be on Wednesday when we would have Bible studies. And then all of a sudden they moved and they moved down by our sign in a whole, whole different place. But while they were there one day I was thinking, how, how can we tell them about the true Jesus? Because anything we give them, like they're going to throw away. So I thought, I was reading Nabil Qureshi's book, um, Seeking All of Finding Jesus. And I thought, well, if I give them this book, then maybe 
maybe they'll be like, it's something will correlate like false religion, false religion, and maybe, you know, but mm. then I realized that they were going to just throw it away because they yeah. really are taught not to read anything. And I think that was one of the questions that came through. How do you explain to someone that they, they won't read anything that you're offering them? They won't read the Bible that you're offering them. So how do you even get through to someone like that? Yeah, I had a similar experience. I actually had a pamphlet that was for Jehovah's Witnesses. And I went and I got these pamphlets and I checked them out and I thought, yeah, this is great. And then when I encountered Jehovah's Witnesses, I was like, here, I'll take yours and I promise to read it. Will you take mine? And they visibly backed away from what I was trying to hand them like it was uh, dangerous or something. And I was like, wait, what? Like, why won't they? And I didn't realize till later what's going on here. Um, they will not take any of your literature as a standard rule. If, we take, if they take your stuff, this is either they're going to throw it away, like you said, or they'll read it in rebellion to what they've been taught. Like the, so the chances are they're not going to do that. But the public relations side of Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, research us, test our claims. That's the PR side of JWs. But in-house, what they actually tell to their people, and I've heard this from JWs myself, they're, they're told in public, they're all told, don't Google Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. Do not use Google to research who we are or what we are. You'll end up getting lies. Like, don't use anything. In fact, they say, go ahead and research, but you're only supposed to use the Watchtower's research tool found on JW.org. So they want you to research, but only their own material. So if you can only use Watchtower published literature, and you can only use the research tool that they give you with the documents that they've written, and the rule is trust the governing body, this is, this is actually... Um, I used to be a domestic violence counselor, and this is what's called isolation. I want to isolate you from any friends or any other influences. Like some, sometimes in a domestic violence home, uh, parents don't want a kid to go to school, to go to college, because they're afraid that the teachers will become an, an influence in that student's life, and they want to be the only one influencing you, that kind of thing. So this is like a DV tactic that goes on. Um, this, this does create a big challenge. Um, it, it's, it's keeping the bubble, right? In, in modern times, we'll talk about Mormonism next week, but Mormonism has done the opposite of this. They've just said, okay, read whatever you want, like do whatever you want. Like we're just going to take it all on faith. The Jehovah's Witnesses have done, instead of they've, they've locked down and done hyper control. And so it's like an experiment between two cults, like which one works better in modern times. For the Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah, don't look outside the bubble. Don't go anywhere else. Only trust our stuff. And it creates a ton of distrust in the Jehovah's Witness towards you, towards mm -hmm. other translations, even if they'll say they don't have that distrust, they do. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's abusive. Yeah. How do you get, how do you break through? Okay. You've got a Jehovah Witness neighbor and you're just like, I really want to share Christ, mm -hmm. but they won't take anything. So how, how do you even break through or, or, I mean, I, I know yeah. God has to do something in their heart, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think things, ways to break through are sharing your own genuine relationship with Christ. This just trips them out. Cause they're like, what? Cause they don't have a real relationship with Christ but also they don't think you do. <laughs> so, right, exactly. um, so when you just share with them that, that's just kind of like a weird thing. It opened their eyes, but also using their literature is what I recommend. And this, this takes homework on my part. I have to already know ahead of time where I can go in Watchtower literature to show them these quotes. Like you could take the quotes I gave earlier, but I would go and find them on jw.org, find them in their archive, right? Use their stuff so that they will, because they don't mind if you show them their own material and talk about it, right? They're going to have to read that and take it as, as truth. So that's the strategy I usually use. And we'll come back and talk more about how to, how to share Christ with someone, but let's go to um, our last question before we actually do that. Okay. Um, the, the translation of the Bible, the, they have a completely different translation. So yeah. how about that? Because they, they just have messed up this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, and when you put it all together, you see, yeah, trust the governing body. Don't research, only read our material. Don't even read the Bible on your own, only read our kind of stuff. And then to kind of come alongside that, they have their own translation of the Bible where whenever the Bible disagrees with their theology, they just change it. I mean, this is, it's, it's, is. I think it works because it's so bold. I think that it's so out there. The deception is so bold and in your face that that actually helps at least for some people, maybe for the more gullible people, I don't know, or people who just want to lean on authority. At any rate, <clears throat> their translation of the Bible is called the New World Translation. And it wasn't done like normal translations are done. Uh, normally you get a committee of scholars and they're credentialed in different areas and you put them together and they work carefully and they oversee and double check each other's work and all that kind of thing. That's how, um, you know, the New King James Version is made, or the ESV, or the NIV, all these different translations. How was the New World Translation done? 
Well, this is weird, but according to the Watchtower, it's done by a secret committee of anonymous individuals that just want to give all the honor to God so they won't tell you who they were. <laughs> right. That works. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know there's a guy named Raymond Franz, though. Raymond Franz was a former member of the governing body. We're talking the elite guys, right? He was one of the elite guys. He left the Watchtower, and then he wrote a book called Crisis of Conscience, where he made very clear that the Watchtower was not of God. And this guy is a guy from inside, as high up as it goes, the governing body. And he told us who actually translated the Watchtower's book. You can get his book. It's on Amazon, Crisis of Conscience. And he gave us four names, four people. And one of them, Fred Franz. Yeah, same name because it's Raymond Franz's uncle, right? Fred Franz. So his uncle was the principal translator and had the most education in, in uh, Greek and Hebrew. And what is his education? Two years of Greek and self-taught in Hebrew. Now, for those who don't know language, let me just say this. When I was taking Greek, and I will not try to translate the Bible, but when I was taking Greek, my Greek teacher said to me, you know, after 10 years of working with Greek every day, you start to really understand it. It's just a big job to translate the Bible is all I'm saying. And you don't want this guy with two years of Greek. He's a noob. He doesn't know what he's doing. Right? Two years is nothing when it comes to translating Greek. Okay. It's just nothing. Um, so they'll deceptively quote scholars. Um, they'll quote scholars out of context in their literature to try to make it look like people like the New World Translation or that they think it's good, but it's totally deceptive. Here's what scholars really think about this work. I'm going to give you some quotes. Uh, Dr. Julius Manti, the author of Emanuel Grammar of the Greek New Testament, she calls the New World Translation, quote, a shocking mistranslation. Bruce Metzger, who's one of the biggest names in Greek in the world, Bruce Metzger, and in, in the New Testament in particular, he's a professor of New Testament or was uh, at Princeton University. He calls the New World Translation, quote, a frightful mistranslation, erroneous, pernicious, and reprehensible. Dr. William Barclay, he, he said that the deliberate distortion of truth by this sect is seen in their new, trans, uh, their new Testament translation. It is abundantly clear that a sect which can translate the New Testament like this is intellectually dishonest. So basically what they do, the short version is this. Wherever the Bible is going to affirm a truth that they don't like, they change it. Right? So Titus 2.13, it says in our, in our ESV, it says, and in every other translation, it's going to say something like this, right? That Jesus is our great God and Savior, right? Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In uh, the New World Translation, though, they say, of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, right? But except that this is based on a really well-respected rule in Greek. And it's, it's called the Granville Sharps Rule. I'm not going to try to explain it because, like, who cares? <laughs> uh, but the point is this. It's like when we say... Um, uh, this is like a standard rule of grammar in English. That's what this is for Greek. And what it means is that everyone knows that Titus 2.13 is saying that Jesus, one person, is our great God and our Savior. That's clearly in the text. They just totally change it. They do it again in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. It uh, says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in a normal translation, Jesus is God and Savior. But in the New World Translation, it says, through the righteousness of our God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. So it just adds words to change the meaning. Here's the crazy thing. The New World Translation, the committee, they knew about the Granville Sharps rule because they use this rule everywhere else in the Bible where it's applied and they ignore it when it's about the deity of Jesus. Okay. There's other places as well. Um, uh, I'll just go to, we'll just go to John 1.1. We'll look at that as a, a final one real quick. But in John 1.1, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's just about every translation is going to hold that the same way. This is a really careful construction. Dan Wallace says like this was written and he's, he's a Greek expert. He says the way this was written in John 1, 1, it was like written to support the doctrine of the Trinity and to keep you away from, you know, modalism on one side or, um, or, or other errors on the other side. So the new world translation though, it adds one little word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a uh, God wait, what? <laughs> right? Like this is, Christians are like, wait, a uh, God? Since when are there even more than one God? There's only one God. This is like monotheism is like kind of a big deal in the Bible, right? But they can't handle John 1, 1. It so clearly teaches the deity of Christ that he is, he is God and with God, right? These two pillars of the doctrine of the Trinity that they just change it. There's no justification for this, but hardly any Jehovah's Witnesses know anything about Greek. So they trust the, uh, the watchtower. So whenever it's the deity of Jesus, they change it. Um, they also add uh, peculiarly, 
they add the word Jehovah into the New Testament 237 times. Now, in the Greek New Testament, we don't have the word. In the Old Testament, it's there thousands of times. But in the, in the New Testament, the word never occurs, right? The name of God. They just say Lord or Kurios. But sometimes they'll translate this 237 times as Jehovah. Oddly enough, um, they'll especially do this if the New Testament is quoting an Old Testament passage and that Old Testament passage said Jehovah, then they'll put Jehovah in the New. You can kind of argue that that kind of works, even if the pronunciation is wrong. You could argue for that. But multiple times in the New Testament where it's calling Jesus Jehovah, they just translate it as Lord. Interesting. <laughs> so they're not, they're not consistent. This translation has been made to support their theology. So when a Jehovah Witness shows up at your door and you say something, so how, how do you tell them that? Like, ah, do you, I mean, do you, do you bring it out? Do you show them yeah. the difference? So I do have a whole long video on tactics of how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'll, maybe I'll do more stuff in the future, but let me give you just quick tips. Here's some just real quick tips. One is I say, focus on one issue and you need to know the issue before they come to your door. Don't try to think of it off the top of your head. Stop, spend an hour, spend an afternoon, prepare for this moment. Um, maybe even spend more than that. So you could talk about prophecy. We haven't even talked about the false prophecy. There's a bunch of false prophecy in the history of the Watchtower. And you could show it using Watchtower documents. You print all that out, you get it, you could show it to the JW and you're ready when they come to your door. You could use the New World Translation to actually show who Jesus is. There are, even though they tried to get rid of the deity of Jesus, there's several places where they didn't, right? They just didn't change it enough times. And so you can go to those passages to show the deity of Christ. You could talk about um, birthdays. I know this sounds weird, but we haven't talked about birthdays. They don't believe in birthdays or blood transfusion. That's actually our next question. So you can just answer that right now. Yeah. So there's a topic that you can pick though. And believe it or not, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses really do care about that. Even though it seems trivial, Um, it is something they care about. It might be a foot in the door. Or you could talk about scandals. Right now you can go onto YouTube and you can see video footage of the Australian Royal Commission that shows that the leadership of the Watchtower was systematically hiding child abuse hiding it and refusing to report it to the authorities. Um, This is because of a whole bunch of issues that were going on at the time. Um, These videos are actually leaders of the church on the stand in court, and it's totally damning. So this is something you can actually use to show what, what, now, am I just trying to be mean? No, no. This whole Jehovah's Witness thing is built on trusting the watchtower. And I want you to know you can't trust those guys. That's the point, right? I just want them to understand they can't trust them. So you pick one of those topics, any one of those, just pick one, go deep into it, know it really well, and then have a conversation about it. And wherever you get stumped, you're going to write down, well, here's where I got lost, right? And you're going to go back and you're going to get better at that for the next conversation. But I have one last tip, maybe two. (laughs) One is control the conversation. If you bring up a scripture, don't allow them to run somewhere else. Keep talking about that verse until you're done. Uh, Just know that every false group is always going to leapfrog from topic to topic to get away once you've shown that they're wrong on something. So you stay on that issue and you chase it down and chase it down. You will, you will be really sad if you let them change topics and you think, well, I have answers for every question. It'll just turn into a, a wasted conversation though. So control the combo. The next one is just have compassion. Um, it's very easy to turn into a combative thing. Remember, this is outreach. I'm seeking to persuade you of the falsity of things you've been taught about God. That's the whole goal there. And it's going to require a lot of compassion. Uh, someone had written in and wanted to know, um, give us an example of someone that you've actually talked to. And do you know anyone that it's really actually led them out of the Jehovah Witness Church? Mm. So this is a little bit of a challenge for me because I'm on a blacklist, which means that they don't come to my door anymore. <laughs> so uh, for a number of years, they, in fact, I actually saw them not, <clears throat> that was a couple of years back. I saw them um, maybe two years ago and they were walking down my street as I was coming out of my house. And I was like, oh, and I, I like have radar. Like I know it's Jehovah's Witnesses within three seconds. I could just tell. And so I, I was like, hey, and I was like coming out to go talk to them, you know, on the street um, as they were, cause they were walking past my house. And the lady just looked at me and she said, oh, we already talked to you. And she, they just skedaddled right out of there. So it makes it really hard for me. Um, I have had a lot of conversations in the past that worked really well. I think that what happened was when they saw that I love the word of God and that I knew these verses in context, they were like, well, that's different. And that caused them to actually want to talk with me because I care about it. And I was compassionate. I wasn't rude or anything. Um, the things that I found to be helpful are um, picking, like I said, I picked like John five. I like using John five because you can show Jesus is equal with God. And I know how to answer every argument they have against that. So I'm prepared for that conversation. Um, and I found at least in my mind, some success in that. 
But the other thing is um, I like to use their actual interlinear Bible. Uh, <clears throat> so the Watchtower produces an interlinear, which has Greek and English on it. And because I know a, just a little bit of Greek, I'm able to actually show them in their own work that they're mistranslating the Bible. And so that's kind of something you have to learn how to do. It takes a lot of education to do that. So I found that to be useful. I remember a guy going like, just looking back and forth going, wait, this is really Watchtower that says this? Because it was so puzzled by how obviously they had mistranslated the Bible. And I talk about that in my video on uh, how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. I go through my example there. The, but however, I found also um, my videos online have been really useful. I've had lots of people talk about how they've left the Watchtower and that my videos were really helpful in that. And one of the biggest reasons is because I don't come off like I'm angry at them or making fun of them. And I've had them say, I was only able to watch your video because you weren't rude or mean to me. Right. I, so I think that that's a smart direction to go. Um, I hope that helps. There's my thought. Well, uh, as far as the sharing Christ with someone who knocks on your door, I've decided that if someone comes to my door, I'm just FaceTiming you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you talk to him for me. I'll be like, hey, just wait a second. Over. I got this guy that, can, that wants uh, to talk to you. <laughs> I'm worried they might recognize me, though, because my, vid my videos on Jehovah's Witnesses have quite a few views. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it's really great. I mean, a lot of the, the questions that are coming in are just like, thank you for your videos. It really helped me. Um, I think one of them said they even left the church because of I'm, there, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Right here. Uh, um, uh, one question someone asked. Uh, was could you come to actual faith from their bad translation? I thought that was kind of a good question. Um, I, I guess it's like possible because there's at least some places where it's not translated properly, but not likely because um, it specifically teaches her heretical things. Like John 1.1, 1, 1 is it says Jesus was a God. That's a pretty big deal, right? Yeah. And, and every time the Holy Spirit comes up, it depersonalizes the Holy Spirit, calls the Holy Spirit it. Also... Um, it takes away the Holy Spirit. And it, so it doesn't say they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says they were filled with Holy Spirit. And so it, it, it deliberately alters uh, Christian teaching. So I, I would think at least the tendency is to come up with false theology by reading that, their uh, New World Translation. Okay. Um, all right. I mean, we're going to ask one last question, and then we're going to go to whatever questions that we have on the Q&A. Uh, they don't tell about birthdays, holidays, no blood transfusions. Like, what is that all about? All right. Um, boy, I could talk about that for a while too, actually. <laughs> so um, basically there's a, there's, a, there's a host of things that they say are pagan things that people who call themselves Christians are doing. And those things, like you said, Christmas, birthdays, celebrating various holidays like Easter or, or Fourth of July for that matter, um, celebrating different holidays and also blood transfusions. Now blood transfusions is kind of a different category. Let's talk first about the celebrations, the birthdays and stuff like that. Uh, what they do is they create anxiety because they're like, you, you know, Christmas is really the pagan celebration of Saturnalia. It's really Sol Invictus. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Easter is really the celebration of Ishtar and the Easter bunny is a fertility symbol. And you hear all these things. Now I've spent my whole, I've done my homework, right? These claims are blown way out of proportion and you can celebrate Christmas and Easter unto the Lord. Now you can also make it like a totally pagan holiday by just taking Jesus out of it. And it's all about Santa Claus and presents and things like that. That's true. You can do that. But, but what they're talking about is not true, right? Okay, so uh, Christmas celebration doesn't go back to Saturnalia. It's on a different date. It's not even on the same date, right? But th these are the types of things they say. Jeremiah 10 talks about cutting down Christmas or cutting down trees and decorating them, but it's talking about idols, carving idols, and they try to pretend it's about Christmas trees, which is, it just gets one over on the Christian, right? right. Oh, you're pagan and we're going to fix it for you. You need to trust our organization. When it comes to birthdays, there's only two places in the Bible where birthdays come up, a birthday celebration comes up. And in both of those times, bad things happened, right? Like Belshazzar is celebrating his birthday and that's where he dies, the writing <laughs> on the wall and all that. But this isn't because it was a birthday. It's not like God's like, you celebrated your birth, death for you. Like that's not what's going on here. Um, so for instance, dogs come up in the Bible all the time and usually for bad reasons, right? Dogs are usually seen as a bad thing. And they, you know, you're a dog, the Gentiles and dogs and things like that. This doesn't mean that having a pet dog is wrong. <laughs> like that's silly. It's just silly. Well, so they believe in funerals, but not birthdays, oddly enough. Um, so there's no biblical reason for that. No real biblical case for that. But when it comes to uh, military service, there's an interesting thing here is they, they want you to belong to the governing body and not to your nation. Your allegiance is to them, not 
to any other worldly. So this is a control thing. So you can't do military service. Now here's an interesting scripture, Luke, thir- Luke chapter three. I don't think I gave you this first, but Luke chapter three, verses 12 through 14. There's a guy who's in the military and he comes to John the Baptist in the New Testament and he asks him, what do you want me to do? Now, if Jehovah's Witness, Witness teaching is true, he should say, resign your commission in the military and, and you belong to God's kingdom. But what John the Baptist says is different. So the soldier asks him, and, what, what, uh, and we, what shall we do as soldiers? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So serve God in a godly way in your job in the military. But they say you can't have military service. So that conflicts with scripture. Finally, with blood transfusions, this is way worse. It's estimated that three Jehovah's Witnesses in the world every day die because they're not allowed to have blood transfusions. They're taught that it's cannibalism. Oh, wow. I had a message literally less than a week ago from someone who says that their relative had died because they were Jehovah's Witness and they refused blood transfusion, so they died. Now, in the past, they were taught that if they got a blood transfusion, they're going to be annihilated by God. They'll lose their salvation. Now they teach, it's, it's confusing now. We're not really sure what they're teaching on it. The Watchtower is changing their tune as they do sometimes. But the, the blood transfusion thing is really, really bad. It's, it's, it's scary bad. And thousands and thousands and thousands of JWs have died since the 70s when they first started really pushing this. Wow. All right. We're going to go to a few questions. We have uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, Mark wrote, uh, a Jehovah Witness friend of mine told me she was concerned with the unity of the Christian church. She claimed that since the body of the Jehovah Witness cult is so unified, it's more trustworthy than the body of the Christian church, since there are so many denominations. I think that's where they're going. Uh, Then she stated, since a Methodist would say something different about baptism than a Baptist, then one of them is wrong um, about everything they claim. She backed it up with scripture, but I don't remember what it was. What do you say about this? Um, <clears throat> okay, so Let's keep going just a little. it sounds like unity is a test for truthfulness in her mind. And she's probably been taught that because that, that sounds like a talking point from the Watchtower. And we get this from other people too. We're so unified. Look at how unified we are. Well, I think that unity is a secondary issue to the actual doctrines of truth. So for instance, let's say that you came across, let's make a crazy example, a crazy death cult where everyone, when they hit the age of, of, of uh, 30, they, they kill themselves and they're super duper unified, man, they are so unified, right? They're the most unified group you've ever seen. They all say and believe exactly the same things. They even dress the same. They talk the same. They, they do everything identical. Does this mean that their cult is real and true? See, this is a bad test for truth, right? This, this kind of unity. Second, the type of unity she's talking about is, is not what we mean by Christian unity. Christian unity is about a love, love relationships and commitment to basic Christian truths. Well, with Jehovah's Witnesses, there aren't those basic Christian truths. So it doesn't even qualify for a unity test in the first place. Across denominations, we have differences, but mo- most of our denominational things, we're going to say they're still Christians, right? We're, we are still unified. We have, a different, we have a different label, right, for our particular church group, but that doesn't mean that we think we're separate from that other group. We're just saying we have, you know, on secondary issues, we have differences. So I, I have friends that are, that are my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ that don't belong to Calvary Chapel, which is where I'm a pastor at. And I, like, Lisa, I didn't even ask you, what, are you a Calvary Chapel? Lisa, I, I bet you better be. Like, I didn't even ask you this because I don't care because we have unity. So denomination doesn't mean disunity. Mormon. No. Huh? I'm a Mormon. Oh, well, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, uh, Iris wrote, my husband read the book Crisis of Conscience by Raymond Franz, a former Jehovah Witness that helped him to receive peace after leaving the organization. Oh, good. He accepted Jesus as his Lord in 2002. Your opinion about that book or anything that would help ex-Jehovah Witnesses? Yeah, um, I have only read snippets of it so far. I've only looked at parts of it, um, but I would definitely at least consider it. I, I, I hesitate to, to just recommend it full on, but, it, but I would definitely consider that. Um, you know, I, I, I read portions of it in preparation for sharing some of the stuff I did with you guys. So yeah, I think that helps. Uh, I think the big, here's the issue, and, and this is where we want to really let our hearts go out to JWs, former JWs. Um, once they come out, they are, it's not like they leave Jehovah's Witnesses and now they have good theology. Right. Everything they've known about God is now in question. Yeah. Every authority they thought was true when it came to believing spiritual things is now 
in the gutter. And they're so confused. And, and they don't even know where their doctrine is different than biblical doctrine yet. They don't know what to believe. They're so confused. So one of the best things is to get them into regular Bible teaching, um, but not like what they've heard. Proof text taken out of context. No, like regular Bible teaching, getting them to read the Bible, actually read the Bible on their own. That's a, a great thing. So, yeah, I think they need a lot of personal care in addition to like books and resources. That's good. But man, it's, it's a lot of trauma and a lot of care that needs to be dealt with after someone leaves a group like that. Oh yeah. Well, uh, when Lynn Wilder, when she left the Mormon church, when she wrote her book, she, she was a tenured professor at BYU. Um, and she said when she finally realized she got out, she sat and read the Bible over and over she wouldn't read anything besides the bible because she just wasn't she didn't believe yeah. anyone or anything so i guess that is almost what a jehovah witness would have to do too to mm -hmm. to walk away do you know many people that get out and really stay and are okay um yeah <clears throat> yeah no it they there it happens all in all directions so <clears throat> just because you left the watchtower doesn't mean you came to jesus right so you've, 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 you've left this cult group. It doesn't mean you, you've had an experience right. with, with the true Christ. So some people, they, they leave the watchtower and they get involved. In, maybe they have just cult, they're drawn to cult. So maybe they get involved in some other cult afterwards. They're just like attracted to that sort of thing. Others, um, they sometimes find safety in, in agnosticism. Yeah. Like, you know what? If I don't have to commit to anything, I never have to risk what happened before. And so they find like a, a sense of safety in just sort of like being on the fence on everything after that. Or even atheism. So I'm going to atheism because I think it feeds that sense of rebellion. That, that, there's other reasons, lots of reasons why they might, but I think it does feed that sense of rebellion that they have against what they used to believe. It's like a freedom, a liberty thing. Like, I'll do what I want with my life. I don't have to submit to anybody else's rules. I am my own compass for truth now. And so there's like that sense of freedom in that. Although atheism robs you of all the value and purpose and meaning right. <laughs> of life. Um, but there is like a sense of freedom that's there that I think is desirable to people. So yeah, I, so my, my thing is to just get you in the word because I'm trusting that God by his spirit will guide and direct you uh, as you read his word without. In fact, let me just quote the Watchtower, right? Boy, if you read the Bible and you don't pay attention to scripture studies, you'll end up with all those old Christian doctrines. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Well, they need the whole truth needs to get in there, and that's that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. Casey wrote, uh, "Jehovah Witnesses can be extremely convincing, especially because they bring up verses like John fourteen twenty eight and Ecclesiastes nine five. Are there um, any resources that help answer these objections from Jehovah Witnesses? You probably have logos right in front of you." <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to pull up John 14, 28. So Jesus says, you heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the father for the father is greater than I. Um, <clears throat> the, here, there's, I could give the longer version on this. The short version is this, is right. Okay. In Christian teaching, in biblical teaching, which Jehovah's Witnesses will always misrepresent what we believe about Jesus and what we believe about God. And then they'll argue against the misrepresentation. Modalism is what they argue against. But in Christian teaching, Jesus, when he, he, he took on flesh, he was still God in his, his being. His identity is still God, but he also is human. And in that hum, human state, he laid aside his glory, Philippians says. He laid aside his glory. So it's totally fair to say God is, the Father is greater than I because there's a sense in which the Father is greater. But that that is a temporary situation. Why? Because in John 17, Jesus says to the Father, glorify me with the glory which I have with you before the world was. So Jesus declares, here's really pivotal things about the identity of Christ, that he had um, glory with God, right? The glory of God, because he is God, right? In eternity past, when he became human, he set aside that glory coming lowly as a servant. And then when he goes to be with the Father, it will be to be, receive back his um, full you know, his, his full glory in his position and rightfully as God. So that's consistent with John 14, 28. That's consistent with all the passages that teach about Jesus. What Jehovah's Witnesses do is they say, if the father's greater then he's like ontologically or in his very essence of being, he's greater than Jesus for eternity. What scripture is talking about is this laying aside glory, the father's greater than me, taking my glory back. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's like a positional relational thing. So people really need to just study these verses on their own to really grasp the meaning of it before so that they can, they can be prepared on their own. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you got to be ready to go. And, and when I say this, they're going to come back with another verse and I want to be ready for that. Uh, my, my video on the Trinity talks about this some too. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and you do a whole video on how to share um, Christ with a Jehovah Witness. So um, Angela wrote, to wrap this up at the end, can you give us like five bullet points to remember when you encounter someone uh, that's a Jehovah, like what, what should you focus on? Yeah. Um, well, the first bullet point is prepare before they show up. Okay. Like you guys, you have homework to do right now. You, you pick a verse, a passage, a topic, and go at it. Look it up in the New World Translation. Go on websites. Look, look gather and figure out your argumentation. So prepare. This means you need to know what you're going to say, what they're going to say, what you're going to say in response, what they're going to say in response, and what you're going to say to that. Like you have to know all that. And how do you learn that? Sometimes just by trying it out and seeing what they say, you know, and how it goes. So I'd say prepare ahead of time uh, to stick to just one topic. Don't talk about everything. Don't talk about every scripture. Stick to one issue. Chase it down right? And you're well prepared and you chase it down. Three would be have incredible compassion. It's not argumentative. It's invitational, right? Invitational, uh, have an awareness of where they're at and where you're trying to bring them to and realize <clears throat> that, and maybe this is the last point is that you just need to put a crack in the dam. You okay. don't necessarily need to convert a person at your door. You need to put a crack in the dam because all this stuff, everything is just built on them trusting the watchtower and the governing body. And if they can just begin to think outside that box, just begin to distrust that group. They will start to see all kinds of things that you don't even know to tell them about. Okay. Uh, Tricia said something, and this is just hopefully to encourage people out there that have Jehovah Witness, maybe uh, friends or relatives. And Tricia said this, thank you for this. I am an ex Jehovah Witness. I was a witness for almost 40 years. Now I've been a Christian for a year. Mike's teaching have helped me, has helped me a lot. I pray okay. for witnesses. Maybe one day I can help. So I think that's just an encouraging, encouraging uh, to say thank you to you. So, um, yeah, we have a million other questions, which, of course, we are not going to get to, which is super sad. But uh, I would just say go on to BibleThinker.org. Uh, Mike's got a bunch of really, really um, awesome stuff there. And he's got a lot of stuff on Jehovah Witnesses. And then Friday, we're going to talk about Mormonism. So now where you live, Mike, you have a lot of Jehovah Witnesses. Where we live filled with Mormons. So it'll be a good conversation on, on Friday because we got to know what, what, you know, how to respond to these people. So yeah. um, thank you for this. We're super excited that you got to do this. Uh, will you pray for everybody really quick before we leave? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray. Um, <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for the truth of Christ revealed to us in the person of Jesus and in the word of God. We pray, Lord, that you'd enable us, empower us, and help us learn how to be better examples and better witnesses of the truth of Christ. We pray, Lord, for our, our Jehovah's Witnesses in our community and around the world, that more and more their eyes would be opened. We pray that more people in the governing body would repent and recant of all of the apostasy and the deceit that has gone on with that group. Lord, we pray that you continue to pull the wall off of the Jehovah's Witnesses' eyes to see that they can't trust the governing body. But we also pray that you would lead them to the truth of Jesus and not just a rejection of one cult. Lord, empower us to be witnesses. Show us that we want to go deep in our knowledge of Christ so that we can take others deep into the knowledge of Christ. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us more opportunities, even especially now with COVID-19, all this kind of stuff. We're, we just pray for more chances and opportunities to witness either online, in person, in, in any way we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Mike, thank you. You're awesome. So uh, thank you for everyone who joined us and we will see you guys on Friday, at one o'clock for Mormonism. So awesome. Mike, thank thanks. You.